uh, human features, um, maybe a little bit taller than average, uh, fairly lean build. He's wearing uh, leather armor that looks like it's had a you know few uh, few scrapes. Um, dark brown eyes, uh, black hair, um, kind of always with uh, kind of at least a hint of a smile on his face. Seems fairly easygoing. Uh, he's got a, a rapier and a couple of daggers on his belt. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what you'd get from a physical uh, description. Can you describe the outward appearance of Flynn for us? All right. Um, Flynn is a uh, tall human. Uh, he's, um, I think he's yeah early twenties. Uh, short, dark hair. Um sort of uh uh light skinned but like tanned from working outside um he's wearing uh chainmail armor uh and he has a um <clears throat> he's got like you know his adventuring pack and everything with some there's some like javelins in there and uh he's got a long sword on his side and he's carrying a um a shield and emblazoned on on the shield is the um symbol of his deity uh can you describe the symbol of shantaya uh yeah it it Uh, yeah, it's a like um, a sheaf of uh, grain. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and then, how about um, Bill? Do you have any thoughts of what uh, Sanguis looks like that you could decide describe Sanguis to us? Yeah, um, you uh, see a mysterious uh, figure before you of noble stature, of uh, a chiseled noble jaw and cunning eyes. Yet within those eyes, you see a heart that cares. But within the skills and the posture, you know that this rogue is extremely dangerous and skilled. He has a uh, long black hair uh, coming out of his um, hood that's over his head, just casting a slight shadow over his forehead. He's quiet, yet he is personable. He has a dagger and a short sword. And it's she's. That's him. All right. Uh, would appear Jimmy has stepped away. So we've got three of you leaving Leyland behind here. Um, and you guys can start to head off into the wilderness uh, towards this location that you have marked uh, from where Barthens has kind of described this to you in the past. Uh, and you're basically heading uh, vaguely north-northeast here, a uh, little bit kind of eastward. Um, and let me go for... Oh, wait, here it said something in roll 20. Gotcha. Yeah, when he said one one a.m. Yeah. <laughs> I don't ask people their ages in general. One a.m. doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, I stay up till four pretty regularly. It's just a question of like what time is like to you. Um, but yeah, getting everything kind of uh, kind of moving here. 
you guys are kind of heading off into this direction, off to the east. Um, I don't have a cheat sheet yet of what you can do with Sangres, but have you prepared survival as one of your proficiencies? And that's basically, is it something that you actually have proficiency in? Uh, do you have the box filled in, uh, Sangres? Um, I don't think I, I chose the, um, the other archetype. Oh, good. So I'm inquisitive, so I don't have, I don't see that. Oh, oh that's fine. Um, but you have proficiencies in things regardless of whether you can swap them with that one archetype. Um, but for now, we're going to have, uh, Flynn is the person who has survival. Uh, if you can do a survival role for me, Flynn, to follow this map as you all are leaving Leyland behind. Um, and for what it's worth with uh, having been from here, um, Kander, you can either roll yourself or simply give uh, Flynn advantage on this roll. What would you guys like to do? I think I'll just try to help Flynn maybe like kind of point out like there's some trails near town that I'm kind of still vaguely familiar with and kind of that sort of thing. Gotcha. So if you would, Flynn, can you please roll survival with advantage here? So following the actual kind of information that you have, kind of triangulating things between what you've gotten from uh, Barthens and kind of what you guys understand together, you are certainly able to do a pretty solid job actually navigating into this wilderness, kind of coming back into kind of the wilds where you're walking into the foothills and starting where everything is always kind of feeling that your footfall forward is always a little bit higher than your footfall or than your foot that's trailing behind. And you can kind of feel like every little bit is always climbing up further and further, uh, very contrary to kind of how leaving Fandolin would feel like everything's always walking down. Uh, this is kind of like the tail end of things where you have to re-ascend into the Sword Mountains here. Uh, you're never going to come like nearly as high as like towards any of the peaks, uh, but these are still like the rolling foothills that kind of come up to the swampland that is the Mirror of Dead Men. Uh, and kind of making your way across things, you kind of cross this ground. And let me have everybody roll a d12. Uh, for you, Bill, inside of roll 20, there's a little polyhedron off on the left side that you can actually mouse over and see just like random dice there. If you can just select a D12, uh, that'll roll a single die. Or I believe you can backslash R space 1D12 in the roll 20 chat. And Flynn, can I get a D12 from you as well? Excellent. And I just remembered because of the hurricane, I changed this map. I want to hide something. And Mara, if I want to scout ahead at all, just to uh, check the area, um, when do I do that? Or are we just kind of, how does that work? Uh, so there's multiple ways to look about how you would be scouting ahead. Uh, there's leading forward with the party, where theoretically Flynn currently is navigating the party. Um, there's ways of actually doing the marching order uh, versus like splitting the party and actually being a scout. So those are two different ways to kind of th think of things. You can move with the group at the front of the party, or you can actually basically set yourself off alone and scout forward. Uh, the difference is, is you're not always going to have everybody agree to let you scout forward. Um, Kander, for instance, is another rogue in his own right, is very sneaky and perfectly capable of doing similar things. Um, so more often than not, with a loud, heavy, metallic paladin following you, you're probably going to be moving like that with candor and yourself moving forward far more likely than simply saying guys wait here 
let me go do this. Gotcha. I didn't know. But it's had... very much up to the group. Yeah. Um, I don't ever want to tell people like don't make who you want to make. Uh, one of the things that will happen on a regular basis is characters will die. So you never have any idea like Candor might exist for the next 17 games we play. He might not. Uh, it's very much just kind of whatever happens by the dice to see how things go. So you should always be playing the character that you want to play. Thank you. Um uh, but in general, usually you want to decide like marching order versus actually trying to, once you find something, that's where there's a little bit more cause to start to like discuss with the group. Do we want to actually separate here? Uh, because I don't ever guarantee you that things are balanced for you guys to win. There's a lot of times that you might actually want to run from a situation. And if you're alone and you find one of those things, you're probably going to get killed very quickly. If you're with everybody and you have to decide to run, you have to decide to run with the group. But there's a lot of just intricacies of it can be very dangerous to separate from the group um, and go off on your lonesome. But it does happen. Okay. So, like, if I want to keep my perception up so that way I can keep an eye out for things, uh, do I just tell you then? Or because Candor's there too, so we're kind of he's scouting. Do I need to? How can I be of service to the group then to make sure that we're in good shape? That's my question. The way to really play your role the best is asking questions about how I describe things. Uh, that tells me what you're focused on, and it allows us to kind of move forward with, like, what is actually intriguing you will often result in tests. There's the occasion where, like, leaving Leylon, I ask for a survival check is basically your ability to follow the map that the other two had had. But often, you're going to have me ask for a check because you're asking a question. Um, so as you guys are heading out here, everybody has a passive perception uh, that basically accounts for uh, like just how when you're moving about, when your attention is elsewhere, how much of your attention do you maintain uh, immediately around you? That's what your passives are for, is basically for when you're kind of already distracted. Uh, but when you're actively doing something, that tends to be when you're actively asking me a question all right go on thank you so as you all are heading into these areas basically following the actual map and kind of some of the trails that candor is able to essentially remember like these past places to kind of find yourselves climbing into the mountains uh, you will eventually come to those points where he becomes less and less familiar with the area itself and more and more you have to kind of depend on sort of some of these descriptive mountains of like this one looks like an old man's nose that you want to start to turn into this gully uh, and eventually with a little bit of certainty that you are on the right path, you guys start to turn down and start to come into a canyon uh, where I've placed you now on the map. If you guys would like to place your actual tokens, uh, this is where um, it sucks to have helped two people and one having left. Um, do you have a character in mind for Sengris? Uh, just kind of an idea of what they look like, a picture you've saved off the internet? Yeah, I, I had a picture before and, and it's kind of disappeared. Let me just upload it again and see if I can find it. So if you look on roll 20, there's a little newspaper. I think it's the second from the left on the right side of the screen. That's your journal. You should see a thing of characters. And then I think I've just named it Doc right now. You just want to edit Doc and you can drop that picture into the avatar there for Doc. Um, not a big deal for now, but eventually I'll ask you to put it into the token stamp generator there so it's circular. 
Uh, which that one, yeah, it looks square, but we can get to that at a later date here. Um, once you, now that you've got Doc set there, if you drag from your name to where the other players are, you guys can, you can see where they've immediately placed themselves on this board. Um, and then this is where you guys want to decide, um, will you have Sangris leading you guys because he wants to, or it looks like right now, Flynn is looking to lead forward because he's far more capable of actually like being a sink for damage to drop into him. Um, so do you guys kind of have a thought there? Well, uh, Kander, um, how would you state your rogue is? Is it a defensive rogue or a passive or a sneak? Or how would you describe your rogue? Um, mine's more of a sneak um, perception character. Uh, yeah, so Kander is, um, you know, he's, he's, you know, fairly stealthy, but he's also a little bit, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of happy-go-lucky, oblivious. He's not usually pushing to, to lead or to, to do any scouting. Um, okay. Um, so I'm comfortable with my, so my thing is I want to scout ahead, see, uh, stay ahead, see, and then re be able to retreat or sneak an attack and retreat. Cause obviously I'm not exactly the strongest as far as my strength or my, um, constitution <laughs> and that's where our paladin comes in <laughs> so i'm good with going forward with perception and stealth if that's okay so while you all are moving forward pretty sure that this gully that you're following and is getting ever narrower and narrower is the one that you are meant to be you can kind of see these cliff faces are rising up 50, 100 feet before there's any sort of ledges of kind of flat area around them. You can usually start to spot different signs of like the actual canopy, uh, often much higher than the actual cliff face around, but you can kind of see signs that there's a uh, canopy maybe like around like the 150, 200 feet uh, that kind of these cliff faces are likely about 100 feet to the foothills around them. Uh, and as you're kind of pushing forward, as it narrows further and further, you're eventually going to come to a point where you start to see more and more the signs of movement in and out of this location. Uh, and eventually, like basically this old, like ruins of a road, and you will see kind of a uh, palisade of relatively old wood but not not aged uh like hundreds or thousands of years but certainly not kind of like present new cut and you can see that there are in front of you the ruins of what would have blocked off this gully ahead of you you can see the doors are like off their hinges and that parts of the palisade have kind of crumbled and fallen with time uh, but there is kind of the signs of a wooden wall ahead of you all. About, uh, looking at that, probably about 60 or 80 feet in front of you. Um, can we look around for any uh, danger up on the cliffs that could hurt us at all? Uh, you can roll a perception. And one of the others could join you here. Either Flynn or Candy. So, yeah, kind of seeing as like the canyon narrows, Candor is thinking back to the kind of that first goblin ambush. So he might be a little more, um, starting to pay a little more attention here. So, gotcha. So join him with a the perception there. Am oh, I yeah. If you're, if I you're actually. Go ahead. I think you're about to ask the same question. If you're actually going to do skills here, like we can use your actual D20 roll and you can modify it with whatever your modifiers are. Um, I have a feeling your perception modifier is a plus six. Uh, but what it kind of comes down to is 
once you have Beyond 20 set up, you should be able to click Perception on your character sheet on D&D Beyond, and it should roll the dice here. Uh, but is your Perception modifier plus six? I'm just trying to find where to find that. To be honest, I'm on I'm on uh, D and D Beyond on my uh, skills uh, my sheet there, and I see some dice the that says tall. The tall, like long list of skills is where you'll find perception. Probably it's, like it's plus down. four for perception. Gotcha. Yeah. So you've got a thirteen. 13. Both of you are kind of sitting about the same thing. You both can be reasonably confident that you're kind of looking up into this be beyond. Um, there's a lot of ways things could be hidden from you here. But you're also not seeing signs of anything that is like clearly there, like, say, shifting sands as somebody is actually moving into position. Uh, but quite frankly, part of the problem of moving into this valley is verticality. You're looking up, trying to spot somebody who can hide from you by stepping back a foot. And that's kind of where the problems come from. Um, but for now, you don't see signs of anybody waiting in ambush. And the walls aren't climbable? Uh, you can most certainly climb them if you would like to try. How high were they? And are they are they flat walls? Or are they... Um, uh more of an incline uh it is essentially vertical where you're looking at actual like mountain climbing here if you have climbing here you're far more situated to do this than not um most of the walls have spots where you could actually find rests around like 50 or so feet uh but this place is very clearly at least like 100 foot walls to where you're getting to the peak that the trees are actually growing it. Well, um, I, I am uncomfortable trying to climb. I don't have any climbing gear, I don't think. So um, I suppose I'm comfortable with proceeding on um, and just keeping perception up. Uh, how about you, Kander and Flynn? Yeah, Kander is going to maybe suggest maybe if we hug one of the kind of the walls um like kind of keep one of these clip sides kind of to our to our back so essentially kind of moving over this way and kind of going up along the side here so we're not climbing but it might make like if there are enemies up here it might make it a bit of a tougher shot for them um so with that idea in mind you all have a kind of sense from Barthin's own description of this and the fact that the mountains themselves are predominantly to your east, that you're kind of like doing a little bit of like an S-curve here. But theoretically, this gate is going to then kind of uh, wheel to the right to the east and head deeper into the mountain. So like theoretically, you're kind of walking up to an area where you are going to kind of move forward, turn with the gate, and go in that direction. So picking which wall you might want to hug, that might tell you or inform you a little bit more with like what your adventures would see in these mountains far more than what you can see perhaps with this map. So I would I would say if we um if we kind of if it's at the s here then we want to come around this side and then stay on this side so we can see farther around the curve so if we uh kind of come here and take a look we should be able to see up this way more and then we can look that way because it should be curving around right yep that's pretty much what you're kind of like walking into from their map or their understanding from barthens so go to the right side in this initial part, and you guys can kind of see like partway through the palisade uh, that's kind of like blocked off this area. And you can see ahead of you ruins of stonework uh, through kind of these fallen gates. There's little bits of more signs uh, of this actual location kind of opening up. Um, no sign of any fires or anything that would kind of creating smoke and more or less kind of sitting in the same situation that you've been at. 
that you can kind of see this wall kind of continues on in that direction before it seems to come to a terminus in another part of this cliff that's just rising into these mountains. And you can see that this is probably, at least at this location, one of the tightest spots and a solid reason for having a palisade there at the narrowest of its locations. Uh, Mara, and just to, um, uh, what, because I think we got to Leylon last session towards evening. Is this the next day or did we leave? Oh, yeah, my bad. I'd say you guys could have racked up for the two of you. You could definitely take long rest here. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I wasn't, and then I wasn't sure about like the light situation, but if it's it's kind of daylight now, so it's not so much an issue. Yeah, that's just one of those things. Like Justin knows, Leylon is a city for you guys to go to at like level six or level seven. It is not something you're meant to be at at this level. So that's part uh, of why I didn't want to distract new players with it. Okay, so um, can I see? Is uh, can I see? I don't see any threats or anything like that from this angles. So I already gave you like a description. What else are you thinking of that you would be looking for as other threats? Um, I I feel like you described the ruins, and just uh, I'd like to just uh, there's this area with some bushes up to the right on the cliff a little bit, and then we have the bushes up there. And then we have the dark area to the right. So before I proceed to look to the right around the corner, I just uh, want to make sure that there's nothing obvious uh, that's a threat. Yeah, so you've already looked up on the cliff edges. That's what I've given you guys the description for. I just described everything in front of you. So if you have something in particular you're trying to like look for, like you can describe something further, but essentially for what you have right now, this is what you're seeing is no signs of life ahead of you. No signs of life around these cliff sides. Um, unless you have something to further elaborate what you're looking for, okay. you're seeing a place that is seemingly devoid of life. Okay, so I'll proceed over to the gates and uh, take a look uh, in the area that I can't see to the right. Gotcha. And is everybody kind of keeping into that same formation of um, Sangris, Flynn, and then Kander? Yeah, that works for me. Uh, Kander will have his kind of his bow shrung at this point. Um, but yeah, he's fallen behind the other two. I'll have my knives ready too. And my sword. Gotcha. Yeah. Assuming you guys are moving with any level of caution, I usually assume that you are geared for battle. Um, there is a certain level of you can only hold a like limited amount of things. So it is also what you are ready to go into battle with. Because essentially, like, you can only hold so much and it starts to actually use up what you can do to start to switch stuff. So you do want to kind of have those things in mind, what you're holding. But as you guys kind of start to round the actual palisade here and you get this first kind of view into this next location, you're seeing more of kind of similar stonework here. The actual face where you were able to see up to kind of deadening in front of you kind of continues on and starts to narrow into this position where you're seeing, uh, where you're seeing like the face of these mountains starts to turn to the east as you would expect. And really the first bit of like non-ruined to the ground earth where you start to see the actual road is still intact in some of these flagstones on the ground. That there's an actual arch kind of bringing this all into like another narrower position. Uh, the arch has walls to each side that are not fully ruined to the ground where they're like a foot or two high like much of the stonework initially in front of you, uh, but the arch actually has walls that are three or four feet high. Still not fully intact defensively, but the arch itself is despite not having doors. And that's kind of the next little bit that you're seeing where you've still got more ruined buildings around you, uh, more signs of this kind of cave area coming in. 
And I revealed a little bit less than the actual arch in the walls, kind of just to the east of you, that you can kind of see around this and kind of limits uh, most of your vision here. But you can see like the first little bit of kind of stairs behind. And it's starting to be a sign. This seems to fit the description of the dwarven runes uh, where these three brothers uh, would have been encamped. But you still see, for now, no signs of anybody camping here. There's no fire. There's no smoke. Um, what would you all like to do? Candor's just going to suggest that we kind of uh, keep moving uh, forward. Maybe uh, keep an eye out to see, maybe look for any sign. Well, I guess mostly in the stone it would be tough to see actual, like, uh, footwork. But he's just kind of for continuing to press on ahead. So as you press on, you want to, like, look for actual, like, footprints and, like, signs of any of the movement around here? Yeah, I think Candor will do that. So, as you're kind of going through the gates, uh, let me get an investigation as you kind of, like, move through this palisade uh, looking for kind of signs. Um, so, kind of, like, moving through, maybe with a little bit of a thought to kind of, like, lift up one of these fallen doors a little bit, you can see that the wood is like crushed down into the ground and shows signs of already being uh like already like so uh i want to say familiar with being face down in the mud but like you can see that like dichotomy of like the side that's always been up to the sun and the side that's always been down to the moisture that's like just with a quick little like lift of the door you can see enough to see these doors have probably been collapsed between like a year or two or like a month or two um but like the rot has set into them clearly delineating that they've been like this for quite some time um and i think again without actually looking over my notes i think technically this campaign in game is still less than seven days um and a week is 10 days in the favor Yeah, just so not, uh, yeah, okay. Probably so not would... damage that has happened since you've heard that the dwarves are here. Gotcha, yeah. So, yeah, he'll kind of, like, share, like, yeah, these have been, seems like this has been uh, in the state for a while. So, you guys are moving cautiously here. You've already pulled your weapons. I assume on some level you are trying to move slowly and stealthily. Does that sound correct to you all? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, I suppose as much as I can in heavy armor. <laughs> so, I normally love to allow people to roll dice, but you don't know how stealthfully you are moving. Um, so if I can, can everybody tell me what your stealth bonus is? Because I'm about to roll to see how stealthfully everybody is moving. And also for Flynn, I'll roll yours at disadvantage. Yeah, it's plus zero at disadvantage, so... <laughs> gotcha. And then the rogue should offset you pretty good, but what are your stealths? Uh, plus five for me. And if you look in that same, like, list of all of your abilities uh, for Sanguis, in kind of that center tower of, of names and abilities, stealth should be towards the bottom of it. What is your bonus with Sanguis? Plus eight. All right, so as you all are kind of moving forward and 
Uh, you kind of have Sanguis ahead of you moving into like the first doorway of this ruined building and starting to approach towards these gates. You start to see like the actual like carvings of these dwarves along this actual corridor. And there's things to be kind of enjoyed and appreciated about what you're kind of coming into. But you still have trepidation to you. You still have a little bit of fear uh, that there's potential coming from above. Uh, and uh, like the actual potential dangers that would have initially taken these dwarves from you in the past. Um, and around as you're kind of approaching this area, you guys are going to kind of hear for the first time probably about... 20 or 30 feet in front of Sangris, uh, the first little kind of like huff of somebody kind of at work. Uh, they seem to be just kind of beyond this gate, uh, but before kind of like the actual like stone uh, entry to this actual like wall of stone that's like walking into the mountain, uh, probably about another like 80 or 100 feet in front of you kind of midway between there you're seeing or hearing for the first time there's somebody conscious there's somebody seemingly maybe frustrated or some such uh just between like this gate and this actual wall of stone uh where these doors are kind of just a little bit hold, held ajar into this entry into the mountainside just here <laughs> Um, I'd like to move over to the side to see if I can get a better view of uh, who's behind the gate. Uh, roll a perception. What are the others doing as he kind of continues moving through this building, kind of like stepping over the last of these stones and crossing towards the other side of this little gully? Looks like Flynn's kind of moving into that ruined home. And Candor, you're just kind of keeping like a back on both of them. Yeah, so I'm trying to move around, not through the building, but kind of um, like between them, following behind um, Sanguis. Gotcha. So those outer ruins are basically about a foot or so high. They're not really going to um, prevent a lot of movement across them. Moving along the actual line of the walls would be difficult terrain, but like stepping over them doesn't really take much effort. Uh, but at this point, you all would actually see the first signs of an actual well, probably about 15 or so feet in front of like Flynn and Sangris. Uh, it's probably about 30 feet from you there uh, where Candor's at. Uh, as everybody kind of looks off, uh, let me get a perception here from uh, Sangris, please. So I rolled a and six and my modifier is four, so that's a 10. Gotcha. Where'd you actually roll at there? Are you rolling like physical dice? Well, I rolled the dice on D and D Beyond, and I thought you said it would sync, but it doesn't seem to be syncing onto here. And I click on the uh, Beyond dice on the chat screen area, and it just gives me a menu. So I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to get it to where you guys see it. Gotcha. Uh, usually, clicking the red die actually does a lot to sync up the two, but again, we can treat with that uh, later date here. But as you're kind of looking forward around this area, um, you can't really see anything ahead of you. But for the first time, you do actually smell signs of wood burning, but you don't see any smoke coming from it. Um, but you guys are close to somebody at this point. Do you want to call out? Do you want to continue to try to sneak up? Are you guys... Yeah, and there, you, you have higher charisma probably than me. Do you want to go forward and try and chat to them? Uh, so... Yeah, Kander kind of he'll looking towards uh Sanguis and, and Flynn and kind of moving up towards them. Um could be so, uh if I may interrupt real quick. I would rather you guys don't actually talk about your actual abilities, um, like on that meta level. If you want to have the person who's going to be the most charismatic in this group 
Flynn is a charisma caster. Um, theoretically, Flynn would be the most charismatic. Um, but again, like, try to learn of what they are, but don't necessarily worry about what their stats are. At this point, just kind of feel out each other that, like, Candor and you are definitely the sneakier two. Um, and Flynn is kind of like a little bit of a religious kind of person um, who's clearly like a warden of battle. Okay. Hey, guys, I, I smell something a little funny. Does someone want to go maybe take a closer look? Because I don't see too much, but I, I smell something. So when you actually go to say something out loud and you speak to them, you guys might actually hear a response. Are you going to try to sign to them that you see somebody? Or are you actually saying to them that you're smelling this? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I I point to my nose looking at candor that I, I'm smelling something. And I put my fingers to my eyes to point to him to go and see if he can take a look to see if he sees anything. Flynn, Candor, how are the two of you reacting to this? Um, each of you are just as likely to smell this as the others as well. Flynn is sorry, just, go ahead, Flynn. Yeah, sorry. Flynn is just thinking we might not have to be so sneaky. It could just be a one of the rock seekers we're looking for, but you know, he doesn't want to just waltz in there if his companions would rather be more cautious. <laughs> so he'll follow their lead for now until he's ready to step forward. Till we're, you know, seen. Uh, yeah, so kind of at the at the signal from Sanguis, Candor will kind of nod, and, you know, indicating he kind of he smells the uh, the burning wood. Um, and then he will kind of nod again at the kind of thought of maybe trying to get a little peek. Um, still trying to move quietly, um, but he'll have like this his bow kind of down at his side. Um, so not like hoping not to look like too antagonistic. He's not sure. Not knocked, but you still have your bow in hand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and he will try and start forward quietly, hoping to maybe try and get a look. Um, probably that's about as far as he would go, like ahead of the others. Uh, roll another perception here. You can have advantage on this one. So you see signs of movement at this point, um, kind of like looking through the actual gate. You're still not getting a solid view. There's somebody down in that little corner. Um, but for what it's worth, rolling that low, even with advantage, I'm going to say you can't quite see who is down there. You've seen like kind of a hand almost flash into your view. You see that somebody is there. What do you want to do? So he's gonna he's gonna look back towards the others. He's going to mime like uh, speaking, and then kind of like shrug, hoping to give them like you know wanting to get a sense like should he call out? Uh, yeah, Flynn will nod. So right at this moment, you guys are actually going to see as this person kind of is like standing up just outside of your view candor and he's actually going to start walking in that direction and kind of pops around the corner with a little pot uh in his hand and you can kind of see like his little start as he sees you all and he just looks up at you you see before you kind of about three and a half four feet off the ground this small stout figure is almost as wide as he is tall big bushy black beard hanging almost to the ground itself and as he kind of looks at you he's just ah, oh, what are you doing here um, uh, sorry go ahead Flint. 
Uh, sorry for surprising you. I suppose we were just being a little overly cautious. Um, you wouldn't happen to be... Because you're going to take me, brothers? No. We're, um, we're actually looking for one of your brothers. Um, I assume you are the Rock Seeker clan? We're looking, looking for no good? No, we're, lo- we're friends of Gundren. He hired us. We're looking for him. And why should I be trusting ye? We have the contract with his signature right here if you want to see it. And I'll bring out the... He's just going to kind of like drop the actual like little container that he had. And you see like a little bit of water kind of splash out of it as he kind of like wipes one of his hands and he's going to approach towards you as you approach. And you can see as his like backhand goes towards his belt where he's got an axe hanging on his belt, but he's going to reach out with his right hand, and he's not grabbing for his weapon, but as he approaches closer to you, and he's certainly looking across the two robes to see that at least the two of them have weapons in hand, and he's very hesitant as he kind of reaches out towards this parchment in your hand. I put my weapons away. What were you thinking there, Kander? Sorry, Kander w- might say, um, you know, uh, Barth and send us out this way. Adding to Flynn's. Um, and then, yeah, he would also similarly move to kind of uh, stow his bow. Kind of like reads over the message for a moment. Kind of, you see as his eyes flip back between the three of you all a little bit less as he like notices like one disarm, two disarm, and he continues like to read the message a little bit further as he's kind of like getting towards the base of this and kind of like gets towards like the little fuller description. Hi. Oh, you might be among the last to have seen my brother. Uh, And this time, with kind of like his offhand moving forward, he'll go to actually grasp your hand, Flynn, uh, to kind of shake. Uh, Yeah, Flynn will return the shake. And I have a feeling with your offhand, that would be your shield hand, basically, that he kind of reaches for. Uh, I'm Nundra, the youngest of us three. And... You say Barthens has sent you here, but you've neither seen Thardin nor Gundren in how long? We were uh, supposed to meet him, uh, meet up with him in uh, Fendelin uh, when we arrived with the uh, supplies he had us bringing down. Came across some evidence of uh, an ambush, uh, but uh, haven't actually haven't actually seen him. Um, they managed to find Sildar, uh, been taken by goblins. We thought perhaps uh, the same had happened to Gundren, but uh, again, we've not actually seen him. Sildar didn't see what happened to Gundren after the goblin ambush, unfortunately. So we've just been searching anywhere we can. We thought maybe he might have made it here. Oh. No, I've not seen them. I don't know how long it's been. He would have set off for a Neverwinter and to escort you back some 15, 20 days ago. I've been alone myself here for nearly that amount of time. Tharden set off into the night some time ago and he never returned. One of the um, 
one of the guards in Fandolin did mention uh, spotting Granite Bane. Uh, I think the of the day the day we arrived in Fandolin, so that would have been uh, six, seven, uh, a bit more than half a ten day ago. I've been the last to go for supplies. It was a bit longer than that since I was there. Resupplied myself in Tharden while Gundren was gone. And where's uh, where's Tharden uh, gotten off to? He disappeared some time ago. He head off to the mine, and he never came back. We weren't supposed to go alone. It was in the middle of the night that he set off. Well, uh, now that we've found you, uh, perhaps we should uh, see if we can find uh, Tharden. Perhaps he knows, uh, perhaps he's got some information of what might have happened to, uh, to Gundren. It'd be desirable. But even if Gundren trusts you, I don't have the same trust for you that he does. We all agreed that the mine stay safe, unless all three of us share their location with another. It's a bond we don't easily break. Like, during a little bit of this conversation, you'll see as he kind of, like, reaches back and he'll pick up his uh, little, like, cup where he was going to grab some more water to boil. And he'll go back to the well, trying to bring you guys back around to this little area he's got, like, in this bottom corner. There's still some supplies here. There's a little sign of a very small... Uh, fire that's kind of like b burning in like a little Dakota like kind of dug out so the fire is actually below the earth and it's siphoning in air from kind of like a little underground passage about like a foot long and he's sitting there very clearly kind of like holding this location but also living in squalor like this is not somebody who's living well He's almost out of supplies and clearly kind of lacking, but is holding this position. So, um... <clears throat> I go over there and I ask him if he's in need of any supplies, if there's anything we can do to help him out. I don't know what I require besides more time. My brother should return. Perhaps I have to return for more dwarves, more compatriots. But the three of us shared this. There are very few where we come from who still believe in the value of these mines. 
it's time for me to leave this place. Perhaps I should wait longer. See a little bit of kind of like despair in this person's eyes. I kind of like the thought of waiting here alone. Um, I, um, uh, bring Candor and Flynn to the side, uh, out of, just out of his hearing, uh, the dwarves hearing, and I suggest maybe he should join our group since he has nothing else to do. Or we should ask him. Sounds like he he's hoping his brother will return once to find him. He doesn't sound like he's going to trust us to tell us where uh, Arden might have gone and he doesn't want us stumbling on the uh, mines ourselves. But uh, perhaps if you were to, perhaps if we offered to have him come with us and look for Tharden, it would be worth asking. And before I chat to him, I just, can I get a quick little refresh? Our mission here is to find Tharden, or is it to f go into the mines, or what was our objective coming here again? Uh, so we are initially looking for Gundren, who is kind of the one who hired us, and the brother of Tharden and Nundro. Um, Kander is thinking uh, maybe... In case we found Nundro, we still don't know where Gundren got off to, but maybe if we find Tharden, maybe Tharden knows. Like, some kind of still indirectly looking for Gundren. Um, that's just his thought process on that. And this dwarf's name was, what was it again? This is Nundro. So I'm this lead was purely about, this is where you knew from, Gun, uh, from uh, Barthens. This is where you all knew the dwarves had been camping because they are not welcome in the actual town of Fandom. Well, all right. Well, I do speak dwarvish. Um, that's one of my languages. And so um, I feel like, uh, you know, he, he doesn't want to leave. Um, I hear that. Um, but it sounds like he wants to find his brother too. Uh, so... Uh, I'd like to just chat to him and see uh, if he'd like to join a party. Just see, let him know it's open to him because we're trying to find his brother. And uh, and uh, is that good with you guys? Yeah, I'd be fine with that. Um... Yep. All right. Awesome. So um, I uh, go over to Nandro and. I um, speak Dwarvish, so I speak to him in uh, Dwarven, and uh, I I tell him, I know there's a lot going on right now, and uh, I can see uh, the difficulty in leaving this place that's so precious to you. Uh, I, we're doing our best to find your brothers, and we could use an extra hand, um, and I re on behalf of our our group i respectfully ask that you join us on our quest to find your brothers uh, but i completely understand if it's better for you to stay here uh, if you choose the latter um is all right hold up hold up i want you to usually like interact in small little bits so i have time to actually respond on something so let's sure. go for that l first little bit where you're asking him to actually kind of abandon waiting for his brothers and join you. Let me have a charisma check, uh, and it can be persuasion uh, at advantage if you have persuasion as a um, proficiency. Okay, just a sec. Um... So, same list of skills, um, and you're just kind of looking if you've got the little dot into it. Is that right now? Yeah, so do you have proficiency, and what is the bonus? If not, because it'll just be your charisma if you don't have proficiency. Uh, you say, where's... Uh, so my proficiency, I do have persuasion. It's a plus one. <laughs> so you have a negative one charisma, probably. Uh, so yeah, so you'll have a six. 
you kind of like look over and he's got a little bit of a surprise over the actual like speaking of dwarvish to him uh but you quickly see like the little bit of kind of like joy from hearing his own tongue is kind of like wasted as like this grim visage kind of returns to him and i appreciate what you're thinking but i can't easily abandon what we've set out so long ago to do so what was the second part of what you were thinking um, I wanted to see how we could help him out here before we go looking for his brothers. I think on that front, he's simply just going to actually, like, basically plead for you to give him some of your supplies. Um, as far as like this goes, it's like kind of like a quick ask for if you have any actual like dry stock, which kind of falls into like um the rice and the kind of like um flour kind of grounds. Most adventures have no reason to have those things on them, so it'll eventually kind of turn to simply asking you for rations, uh, and kind of if you would part with any food with him. Um, and you kind of like get a little sense. He's got the well there. He's got food. He can forage for some food. Uh, but having food for like the worst of days when he like doesn't have like a good sense of where to forage is probably the most ideal for him to be able to stay in this location. I have no clue how much uh, food we need. So do we have enough to spare just to give him an extra day? Yeah, I mean, like, a ration is a day of food, so usually, like, a ration is basically, like, um, what is that, like, three meals worth, basically, to eat a ration. But, like, you can survive without any ill effects by eating every other day. Do we so know how many rations we have? I have eight days on me. Yeah, so Kander's gonna kind of looking in his pack and sees he's got a couple days worth of food um so he's going to kind of he'll like take out one and then kind of think it over and then take out um the rest and kind of uh yeah have it ready to hand over so two days worth that anders yeah flynn will give two days as well i'll give two days also Uh, let me just get collectively from you all um, another persuasion roll here. Just one from each of you. My <laughs> dice are crap. Absolute crap dice. Bad. The best part about this game is actually failing. There's a lot of times where being successful is going to be fun and cool, but most of the stuff that you honestly will remember and tell stories about is when you fail. Uh, it is some of the funniest stuff, but this isn't really a failure point. This is just to kind of see like his own kind of like sense of gratitude here. And overall, the group is giving enough that I would say you do see like a certain sign of like this kind of hardened individual like is a little more trustworthy at this point kind of like turned a little bit and you can kind of see like perhaps now i understand why gundren cares so much for you you're welcome to the rock seekers as far as nundro's concerned you all are too kind Uh, but among kind of the things, like, you know, you're essentially giving him another, like, 14 to, like, 20 days in this place before he has to actually move on. That he can kind of hold off for this amount of time trying to figure out more and more of what is actually going on with his brothers. Um, but theoretically, at this point, you guys are 
relatively done with like what would come across here unless any of you all have any other ideas or any other questions that you would ask of him so Thardin went to the mine but you can't tell us where the mine is because you need all three of you need to agree so we can't go looking for Thardin right now but I guess we can resume our search for Gundren, wherever he may be. Hey, Kander, do you think you can try and convince him to tell you where the other mine is? Well, he's, he's anything like Gundren. Uh, rock seekers have a stubborn streak, even for dwarves, but uh, we could... Uh, I suppose we could try the uh, try the goblins again, see if we can uh, bring any more information out of them. Any more information? You already got information from the wee little green folk. Well, the... They came a bit more talkative after we uh, took care of their bugbear problem. And he'll kind of describe a little bit about how um, Clark, the bugbear, was kind of like, in, you know, had taken over the goblin cave. And we kind of, um, with a couple of the goblin's assistants, managed to kill him and uh, essentially kind of come to an agreement with the goblins. I'll follow you guys' you'll, lead. You'll see like a certain amount of like both like kind of joy and almost disgust on his face as he basically hears this story of you guys kind of like turning that entire cave in on itself where you have one faction attacking another and then he kind of like catches himself where he's starting to enjoy a story about goblins and like the disgust returns a little bit. But he struggles to stay in, like, a poor attitude, despite kind of hearing something that is semi-joyful. But yeah, theoretically, that's what you guys have got from him. Um, you've got this actual temple to the east of you. Uh, you've got what you really came for here. Um, it's up to you guys kind of what kind of thoughts that you have. Uh, do you want to kind of ask further about the actual temple? Um, do you want to see if there's like a reason why he's, I, I don't know. Do you guys have any intrigue about this or are you more or less kind of finished and you want to head off and start your pursuit of Gundren and retracking those trails of the goblins to the north? I'll follow you guys as a lead. I'm still figuring this out. So, I think uh, Kander would be curious about, uh, yeah, be curious about this temple. Kind of maybe asking Nundro, like, you know, you know, explored the, you know, been here a while. Have you explored any more of this place? Kind of, is there a particular reason you, you chose this, uh, this spot? Our exploration was quick enough to know that these weren't the mines that we sought after. I believe in ancient times, these were certainly the runes of something of value. But I feel the value's been stripped of this place. Unlike our goal in coming here, it still possesses the value to continue deeper. So is this a temple to our right, or is this a mines to our right? Uh, so, like, you guys are on kind of this precipice of, like, the stairs, 
that lead into the actual mountainside to your right. Uh, the kind of dwarven statues that are on this screen stand probably about like 20 to 40 feet overhead, like on their own plinths that are already kind of like 10 or so feet tall. Like the dwarven statues are like 10 or 15 feet tall. And then essentially right where the actual wall is here, uh, there's like two large stone doors that are mostly closed uh, but they're still kind of sitting just kind of slightly ajar. Um, and those doors are probably about that same kind of 20 or 30 feet tall. So is it offensive for people to uh, go in and go through those doors and see what's in there? Or is it, would it be offensive to Nandor? Or Nandor? You are doing me no offense by going in there. It's a small enough rune that you're not going to get lost. What do you guys think about exploring the ruin? I'd be curious to take a peek myself. Let's take a gander. Um, can we, uh, I'd like to ask Nundro if there's any dangers or anything we should be aware of. The temple is small enough. It's had many cave-ins, but you're not going to be surprised to see that. Be weary moving the stone. But you all are welcome to explore. All right, well, I suppose we'll take a look inside. And uh, Kander is going to um, kind of as we're as we're heading up the stairs, start pulling out the uh, the lantern that he carries and uh, like preparing it with uh, one of the flask of oil. That's so probably be pretty dark inside. Gotcha. Yeah, you can essentially see like this entryway is kind of the same space that you've already been talking on. Um, so he's kind of sitting just off of you, like stage left here, um, kind of continues on like um, brewing like this little bit of like a tea or some sort that he's kind of like heating up some of this water. Uh, and you guys can see like where these doors are just kind of ajar. And as you actually start to like look into the temple, you can see probably about like 20 or 30 feet in to where there's more doors that are kind of actually like knocked off the hinges and kind of block off this like entryway to a larger ch chamber beyond uh, where uh, Sengris can probably pick up like the little signs of um, like something beyond, uh, including probably picking up like the start of a couple of actual uh, like columns that seem to hold up the ceiling. Um, and from there, uh, what lantern do you have? You've got the hooded lantern? I have yes. a hooded lantern, yep. Gotcha, are you lighting yours as well? Uh, yes, with, uh, I'm lighting my lantern too. Gotcha, so as you guys kind of light that, you can basically see into the, the actual like uh, foyer here and kind of see this initial part of the temple. Um, anything that you are seeing with dark vision, I am always going to describe to you. You are never going to see that stuff on the map because the black and white night vision is always going to be hindered by something. And that includes the actual, basically becomes theater of the mind. So you'll usually get little bits of extra hints that are just for you. But in general, just recognize that walking around without light is always going to be a sacrifice. Your vision is always better than trusting dark vision. And that's kind of one of those things to kind of keep in mind where there is value in having that light there. Um, but as you guys kind of walk through this initial kind of open area, uh, very recognized like as kind of an entryway where often you have essentially something like a portcullis to create a defensible point. Um, and kind of coming through here, you guys will spot uh, that there are some kind of rocks kind of like dropped off 
And as you kind of like enter into the foyer, you can see that there's a little bit of an entry that kind of like moves into the rocks off to the north, uh, where you see even more kind of rune rocks within. I just move forward to that area where the rocks are open to the north. So at that point, you actually start to light up some of the actual uh, columns to the east of you. And you can actually see about 40 or 50 feet to the east where this room kind of starts to come to a terminus, giving you at least a little bit of a sign that at some point this was probably a temple. Uh, once you actually come around into like that area, you can spot like a little bit of the size of the room that is to the north of you there. I'm going to go into the room. So moving in, you can see some of the rubble. You can see a little bit of a sign where the room actually like continues off to the east again in a small little corridor. And that's where like, you'll see kind of the first signs of like a full collapse that actually blocks the corridor that's there. And from here, you'll kind of see this room, at least at present, is a dead end. Um, there's the potential where you could clear this stone. Uh, you're going to invest quite some time as you're talking about moving, you know, thousands of pounds of rocks at that point. Okay, I'm going to go into the main uh, temple room. Uh, and have we seen any uh, like uh, iconography? Um, I mean, Cantor has no idea about dwarven gods, but just anything that looks like kind of like a you know religious iconography that might be able to kind of like point out probably more towards Flynn. Uh, Flynn, do you have religion as a proficiency? I don't see it. No, I don't got. I don't have. That. Gotcha. Um, we can go forward. Just let me get a religion check from you, Cantor. Uh, I'd say at this point, you're kind of just walking around in things that, like, the actual room that you guys are in right now, that, like, you can recognize, like, a certain amount of kind of religious, um, like, tendency to them as far as the iconography goes. I'm going to say from here, nobody's really familiar with the dwarven gods enough to fully recognize uh, like what deity that you might be exploring a room of. Now, if yeah. I can speak Dwarvish, can I read Dwarvish too? Uh, you can indeed. You can both speak and read. Is there anything that I can read in the room? Uh, roll a investigation. What's my modifier supposed to be for that? Uh, that same row of skills. Oh, plus four. Should... Yeah. So it's 15. Uh, so, looking around the area, um, you see different runes here and there that kind of clue you into some of, like, the actual, like, meanings of things. Um, but it's kind of more along the lines of, like, almost, like, individual kind of thoughts where you can see things, like, towards, like, um, piety and honor um, little, like, single kind of runes that are almost meant to be um, kind of like almost like prayer wheels and things. Uh, there's nothing of actual, like, note kind of written in here that gives you, like, text to read. Um, I inspect the altar? I mean, that would what include it. What's about? Okay. That would include it. You're inside of this this room as is. Uh, so as you guys move further and further into here, uh, I actually need everybody to roll initiative. 
Um, and this is actually where I'm going to ask, are you still good, Bill? Has your wife returned at this present? Not yet. Um, so I can keep going, but if I disappear, then I guess my character got <laughs> taken away. I don't know. <laughs> so, well, uh, it's up to you guys. I, I, I'm good with going, but uh, once my wife gets here, I'm probably going to have to bail. So we got a late start bringing on new folks. So it's one thing where I normally would cut us out here. Um, if we can kind of continue in the moment, that would be um, better. But basically, as you guys kind of move forward and you're looking for more information in this room, there's just going to be kind of a moment where you're like looking down and you just kind of hear like a little bit of a dripping sound. And it's just... And then there's just going to be a loud kind of splash, but there's no like reverberation from this liquid splashing out. There's just going to be kind of an amber, golden, yellow blob that just slams down into the ground. Um, so this is where if everybody's good to go forward, I say let's still keep with it and then we'll potentially just stop things when Bill has to actually go. All right. I think I know why. The his roll t uh, beyond twenty isn't working. Uh, the token needs to be the same name as the D and D Beyond character, and I think in the character sheets it's listed as Doc for some reason. <laughs> oh, right, that actual name would be. Yeah, it needs to be the exact same name as the one on D and D Beyond. Um, what is your dexterity with Sanguis? My dexterity is 18. And I rolled a 17. Oh yeah, no offense or anything, but pretty much once you create your character, you never need to actually know the number. Now the modifier is all that ever matters. So a plus four... Oh, uh, so we got you at 21. Yeah, it's just essentially the only other time that you need to know what your stat is, is that you can't ever get your stat above 20. Got you, the mod. Got you. Thank you. That's why, like, one of the settings is actually to decide, like, modifiers top. And it's just stupid for them to even ask because the modifier is the only thing that's useful. Um, so yeah, at this point, we are going to start with Doc uh, as this kind of like golden glob of liquid, like very much unnaturally slops down from the ceiling above you, um, very much almost like a really thick gravy kind of dripping off from something, um, or one of the worst of liquids, like a very thick vomit kind of sinking down from the ceiling. What would Doc do in response? Well, I have um, those features and traits for, um, where was it? Um, insightful fighting, but it's goop. <laughs> and can I do, uh, I have eye for detail. Can I see what it is? and? how to try and do something about it. Can I get a perception roll to see if there's a weak spot for the goop? Uh, yeah, you can use your bonus action to do your insightful fighting. Um, I feel like that's a pretty solid eye for it. Um, yeah, you don't want to do eye for detail here. Eye for detail would be something previous to this. Okay, so, so yeah, insightful fighting. Insight check there. Um, that'll give you the actual advantage on this. Um, yeah, you don't actually gain information, but it allows you to gain advantage to sneak attack it. Um, so yeah, just follow through with your main hand weapon. 
Um, were you holding two daggers, or did you have a dagger and a sword? Dagger and a sword. Were you, were you still cautiously moving forward that you think you have weapons out still? I did not have any weapons out. We achieved them before we came in, and I have my lantern in my hand. Gotcha. So, free action, you can pull your sword, because it's a short sword, right? Yes. Yeah, so free action, you can pull your sword. Bonus yep. action, you can gain insightful fighting and just make one attack with your short sword, and you can apply your sneak attack as you have insightful fighting on this creature. Okay, now I will sneak attack then with my sh uh, short sword. Uh, so yeah, you sink into this creature with your sword uh, with that hit, uh, regardless of your modifiers, which are at least a plus four. You've got that. Um, short sword, I believe offhand, is a d6, and it'll be plus your dexterity of four. So just roll a d6 here. Um, yeah, we might be able to try beyond again if the name's not... Um, I'm not going to waste time in session. Okay. I'd like to spend time with Bill, giving All him right. a lot more familiarity um, before we play next. So, um, yeah, so that'll be nine damage as you kind of stab into this creature, uh, seemingly kind of like piercing through it. You see your sword like go in. This thing is not opaque. And then you kind of can remove it out. Um, if you'd like, you can move away from it now. There is a certain danger in any time in combat that you move away from something that you are in contact with, uh, that it will be able to essentially attack you as you clear that space. And I think you'll also get 2d6 for sneak attack, right? Oh yeah, my bad. I forgot the sneak attack. But yeah, it's 2d6 at level 3, so roll two more d6. I guess realistically we could have just had you roll all three because of the sword. So, what is that? 9, 16 total as you pierce through this creature. Um, it's definitely comical to imagine in sight of a fighting. You're, like, piercing through. Like, you can see the mitochondria inside of this gloop, and you're like, those are more important cells. And you're able to, like, slide your short sword into it. But would you like to clear any distance between you, or are you going to essentially end your turn here, Doc? I, I would love to clear some distance. Um... Would he get an extra attack on me if I try to uh, to get away? Because that's what I mean. Yeah, like it's not just free that you do it. There's a danger involved. Yeah, I'll go ahead and because uh, I don't think I have that much um, uh, constitution, right? So if I try to run, he can get two shots versus one. Is that correct? Uh, you don't know what it can do when you run, but as far as mechanics go of this game, no. I'll I'll just uh, run behind Flynn. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Um, uh, I suppose, so it doesn't matter how far away I run, right? So uh, he can still have the attack. How far can I actually run away? Oh, um... You're a rogue, right? Do you have... Yeah. He used his bonus action for insightful fighting. He cannot oh, disengage. Okay. This is one of those things where that is the learning experience, is that insightful fighting uses the very same action economy as being able to stab something and safely leave it. So this is where you will eventually have to like make those decisions with that character. Um, but effectively... This thing's dropping on you. We're starting with you with fresh movement. So you can move up to 30 feet away. But if you move away from touching this creature, it's probably going to be able to attack you. I'll just I'll just uh, try and take it, I guess. <laughs> gotcha. So it will go to Candor. Uh, what would you like to do is this thing like slops down in front of um, Sengus and another one kind of slops down on the floor to the south of you. Yeah, so seeing this one right in front of uh, Sengus, Kander's running in that direction, pulling out his rapier as he goes. He's also got his lantern um, still in his hand. He's going to come up here, uh, stab out at it with his uh, rapier.
That will hit. And for another 14. Uh, and then he is going to kind of like uh, show a little fancy footwork, uh, move back towards Flynn. And uh, yeah, that will be his, his turn for now. So just a reference for you. Part of his subclass is basically he's much more of a sword fighter um, than most other rogues will be. If he attacks something, I think if you attack it, you can disengage without it being able to attack you, right? Right. That's the yeah, the fancy footwork. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to hit it. You just have to attack it. So that's kind of his thing is to be able to do that as he's very deft at kind of moving in and moving out of combat, um, kind of slashes out at this thing and then steps away. Um, and then we're going to go to Kander. What would you like to do? Or not Kander, Flynn. Yeah. And I just to know, I think Insightful Fighting, if I remember from when I played a, that subclass, lasts for a minute. Yeah, that sounds right. So I just don't know, I don't think you have to do it every turn to get the advantage. Like once you've succeeded, that, you know, you don't have to use it again and again and again. Um, All right, Flynn's turn. Um, yeah, I'm in this awkward position where I know something Flynn doesn't, but since Flynn doesn't know this, he's going to have to learn the hard way. He's going to slash at the thing with his longsword. Gotcha. And pretty sure I know what happens next. It does <laughs> indeed. Splits in two. So that creature, I do bloodied at 50% health. Uh, Kander would have bloodied it with his attacks. So you know on some level that creature is 50%. Once something is under 10 hit points, I do mortally wounded. Um, usually it's going to be like red or I chose the dark pink for some reason for bloodied here and then pink for mortally wounded. Uh, this creature is already going to be severely wounded before it splits here. Um, but yeah, as Kander or as Flynn slashes through it, you've got a great sword, right? Or oh, long longsword. As long you sword. slash through it, the like remaining chunks of this thing kind of are like just like blobs of it, almost like spreading out as like individual like splash points of this creature. But you see as a few of them kind of start to coalesce back together. Um, and then they are going to form up and attack you. Yeah, the ochre jelly splits into two when you hit it with slashing, but <laughs> Flynn didn't know that. I did, but I thought not... Andro said it was safe in here. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> So I'm going to go for, we'll see which one this one's going after, and then the two in contact with you. Perfect. Everybody gets one. Kander, your one is just a little bit bigger. So we'll go for just right down the line of Sanguis, Kander, Flynn. Um, so Sanguis should get hit with... Um, I think it's a plus four. So yeah, 19. Um, Flynn should get hit with a 20. And does Kander get hit with a... Oh, wait, no, I said that wrong. Flynn is the 12. That should miss. Can The two rogues should get hit. Both of those are 20s, basically. 19 and 20 hit both of you? Yeah. So that means if I have hit points of 12, I'm dead? No, nope, no. Nope. Right now, that's just to hit you. Um, I'm right about to actually roll damage. Um, but there's definitely a good chance that you might get killed here. Um, oh, yeah, that one, it can't actually split if they're that small. Because it, it's already too weak. So we're going to go 50-50 to see who actually gets attacked by the jelly between the two of you. Um, but regardless, it's still pretty much going to be a hit because it's the 15 and 16 we're taking. So odds will be Flynn. So it is going to attack uh, Sanquis here. Uh, 
Um, and let's see, this first one is going to be on Sanguis and then on Candor. So you said you have 12 hit points with uh, Sanguis? That's what it says. Uh, so as it kind of like splashes into you with like this extended out arm, um, you're basically going to see is like uh, Sanguis gets like slammed back towards that uh, pillar that's like right between uh, Flynn and like himself, like bashed into that pillar pillar and you start to see is like his flesh starts to like melt away from that point you are going to go unconscious here um this is one of the points where i will normally have you whisper this role um to check with me for your death saves you are not killed outright it does not do enough damage for that because it's going to do a total of 17 damage to you it needs to do 24 damage if you're at full health and you have 12 hit points needs to do twice your maximum or it needs to do your maximum once you're at zero hit points um so you've got the potential to be saved here but at present you are getting knocked out by a single hit um and then candor you're going to take a similar hit for 10 hit points uh where you'll get smashed back from the bludgeoning is that first six uh, which is eight damage and then two points of acid damage kind of eats into you um in a pretty similar fashion as these things kind of like just kind of like slide across and then a massive arm of liquid kind of forms from it and it almost leaves like a little bit of a booger behind as it kind of moves across um and then doc um if you go in roll 20 and hover over the dice roller there's a little gm at the top left of that dice roller uh, if you can click that, it turns it into a whisper, and then roll a d20 on uh, roll 20 there. Excellent. Um, so that's just for us to know. Anytime somebody is unconscious, if you care about your friends, it needs to be a top priority. And that's why one of the things about death saves in my games is they don't count unless they're whispered. There might be a few occasions here and there where I tell, you know, you can roll out, out in general. Um, but for right now, that roll happens, uh, and it's going to go to Candor. You've got one of these things on you. You've got one of these things that is incredibly wounded uh, and is mortally wounded already. What would you like to do, as well as one of your friends on the ground? Yeah, so Candor seeing... Uh... Sanguis kind of go limp after he gets slammed into the pillar and kind of Candor's not looking great himself, but he's going to um, kind of sidling around, trying to sidle around this this one in front of him. He's going to uh, look towards Flynn and like, you know, it's like, kill it, kill it. Uh, but he is going to uh, basically like kind of like dropping to the ground um, and trying to uh, Gonna basically drop his rapier, grabbing out um, the healer's kit, and he's gonna heal up uh, Sanguis. Gotcha. Uh, for a total of nine hit points back. And then, do you have any interest in using your bonus action for anything? Yeah, and then he's going to uh, bonus action, disengage, kind of uh, keep moving. Um, so you can do your move uh, now that you're disengaged. It's going to go to Flynn. Uh, you've got Candor telling you to kill it, kill it. One of these is mortally wounded. One more attack into it. You've seen him heal Doc, and Doc is coming back to consciousness. What are you thinking? Um. All right. So, did Flynn learn enough to know that stabbing is better than slashing in this? Technically, case? you have not actually split it into two, so I would say you are even more confident that your sword is the right choice. Oh, I didn't see it be ineffective against it. No, it was already too weak to be split into half. Yeah, but it still takes no damage from my sword, so would I have seen when I sliced through it that it didn't seem to be hurt by it, or...? Why did it take no damage from your sword? Oh, well, I'm sorry, I I shouldn't be metagaming, but... 
I, I thought they had slashing immunity. Oh, I'm sorry. Stop reading up on creatures. I'm if not... you are playing in my game and you talk about stuff that you think you know, you don't know how I do creatures. Okay, I'm sorry. I just... I, I didn't read up on them. I just know these things from a... <laughs> if you meta game creatures, you will never again see a creature out of a monster manual. Yeah, I'm not... Sorry, I wasn't trying to. I'm just wondering if... Yeah. All right, well, uh, I guess I'll keep slashing at him then because uh, I, if, I d if it doesn't look ineffective to him, Flynn will keep slashing. Stop metagaming and play. Uh, sorry. I'm... <laughs> I just want to know if it looked effective or not to Flynn. <laughs> so slashing across it again, it kind of like splashes out into these globs and the magic that is maintaining this creature is going to dissipate. Any movement from you? Anything else that you would like to do? Uh, yes, I want to put this one myself between this one and uh, Sanguis. So it's going to continue to kind of like lop towards Candor. Uh, it will hit you again, and I think regardless, it's going to take you down perhaps more to see if it insta kills you. Uh, 10 damage should not be an insta kill. But it will not no, be conscious. Yeah. Um, and then similar situation here, Doc. You are down on the ground. You've now technically dropped everything that you were holding. So while you're on the ground, you can free action pick up your sword. Uh, you can go ahead and stand up with half your movement. And then you basically have like the goop of a dead creature beside you. And behind you, you can see another one of these things kind of like splotching over Candor and kind of like knocking Candor unconscious. Uh, what would her who just healed you? What would you like to do, Doc? Um, Sangris. So to clarify, I don't see any colors around the glob. Um, so it's not damaged, correct? Yeah, at present, you've not actually seen anything. Um, it's hard to imagine why you would know that these things get hurt. I'm just, I like to use the mechanics of actually showing you guys. Despite sometimes monsters, there's not a clear reason for you to recognize bloodied and uh, fatally wounded. It's just something that I like to use because I think it adds to the game. Okay. Well, I'm barely alive as it is, um, so... Um, what I'd like to do, uh, do I have enough, uh, movements to where I can attack it? Yeah. Like if you stand up, that's basically 15 movement. Um, it's half your movement, which is 30. Cause you're half elf, right? It was the other one who was the elf. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so you could stand up for 15. You could move towards it stab in with your short sword and then use your bonus action as a cunning action to give yourself 10 feet of distance between it. And that would be all of your movement. It would be all of your actual action economy. Okay. Um, so, uh, candor is candor like completely dead or can he be healed? A pretty similar situation. If you've got a way to heal him, you could heal him. Uh, if you've got a way to stabilize him, you could move up to him and make a medicine check. Um, and you could do a pretty similar kind of movement of standing, moving over to him, uh, healing him with like just doing a healing medicine check. And then you could disengage to give yourself five feet of uh, space between that creature and yourself. Um. It seems like the thing's not dying, so I'm going to I'm going to try and kill it because it's going to kill us no matter what. So I'm going to go ahead and stab it, and uh, then I'm going to back away. Gotcha. So you can grab your short sword from the ground as you're standing up, move up into that creature, and make a attack here. You can roll a d20, and I think we're adding plus six for you. That will hit. Uh, and then your short sword's a d6, and you've got a sneak attack of 2d6. You can roll 3d6 
and I believe we are adding one more D6. Uh, and we'll add, uh, I think, four to that for your dexterity for a total of 18. Um, and then you can cunning action disengage. Um, essentially, you have to move to there, but you can move 10 feet from there if you'd like, wherever you'd like to disengage to. Um, and then it's going to go to Candor. Can you roll a death save, please? Solid. And then to Flynn. All right. Um, I'll move over here. I'll uh, put my hand on Candor and give him 10 hit points. And. Um, yeah, then I'll just, I don't know, yell, hey, hey, trying to get its attention, because it keeps attacking the ones I don't want him to attack. <laughs> so it is going to splotch out after Doc, and it's kind of like a big arm, like, extends out and just slams down into the ground. Uh, I believe a nine is going to miss you, and you just see as again, it kind of leaves this, like, booger trail behind it, uh, and we will return to Doc. So this is where, now that you have your short sword in hand, you can use your free action to pull your dagger, make an initial attack with your short sword, and then you can use your bonus action to stab with your dagger, or you could bonus action to disengage to, again, put some distance between you and this creature. So I'd like to stab with my short sword first, and then we'll decide what to do after that. I want you to actually tell me what you're doing. Because all of this is happening in an instant. So what all does... Right, I'm just going, going to town. I'm going to I'm gonna uh, just whip out my uh, dagger, stab, and then stab with my short sword. Excellent. So theoretically, short sword should be first. We'll hit. Um, if you'd like, you can roll your dagger attack right now just to hit um, another d20. Um, and that one's going to miss. Uh, and then with your short sword, it's the same thing. It's uh, 3d6 plus 4 for damage. Yeah, it looks like 17. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that will once again kind of bring it right past bloodied state and right into um, the mortally wounded. And it's going to go to Candor. Now, uh, you were on the ground. Your rapier you left behind. So I think right now you're... I don't know if you really dropped anything because your medicine kit, I don't necessarily think of that as like being out in your hands once you heal someone. So what would you like to do? Yeah, but I was thinking, yeah, because he had the lantern in one hand, so it needs at least Yeah, I one guess the lantern at least would be on the ground. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but I think he's going to kind of coming to with a gasp as Flynn managed to heal him. He's going to stand up, um, pull out a dagger, and try to finish off, you know, stab out at this thing um, that's still kind of right in front of him. Solid hits. For another 12 damage, that will indeed um, end this creature. As you kind of, like, just stab into it, there's just, like, a piercing moment where all of a sudden the, like, surface tension that's holding all of this golden liquid together just kind of ceases. And in a moment, it just kind of, like, slides out on the stone. And you can hear there's kind of, like vinegar on limestone kind of levels of like there's little bits of sizzle kind of happening as this kind of spreads out across the stone very mild acid uh but i believe everybody but flynn felt on flesh it's enough that you don't want these things to touch you so do we need to rest to heal each other or or sorry do we need to rest or can we heal each other so that comes back to the level of, um, I think, Doc, you were healed for like 11 or something. So you're at almost full health, right? What did Candor heal you for? Well, I got hit for 17 and I had 12. So that means I was at minus five. No, you, my bad. Me. You only ever go to zero. That's where the, the extra 12 comes from. There's zero 
or 12, like your hit points beyond that, and you're dead. But you're only ever at zero until you're dead. Okay, so I have, uh, so I think he get he did nine, so I'm at nine. Okay, so you would still technically be mortally wounded here. That's where they could see that you are still incredibly unhealthy. Um, it's one of those things. Being low level, you don't really have a bloodied condition so much as you quickly become mortally wounded. Um, so you guys can kind of see each other. Like the two rogues here are definitely in rough condition. Uh, it doesn't mean that you guys need to rest, but you can certainly take these thoughts into mind. Uh, you've just kind of like basically had these things drop off of the ceiling of this place uh, as kind of a surprise. And how would you recover from that? What would you all like to do? Yeah, so Kander kind of recovers the um, uh, recovers his, his dropped item. Uh, he is going to take a little time to kind of patch up some of his own wounds here with the uh, with the healer's kit that he had used on uh, um, Sanguis, and he'll be able to. Uh, you'll see he's much, looking much better after that. All right, so I'm assuming I'm fully healed after the healing kit. Uh, can we inspect the globs to see if there's anything of note or any valuables or anything, or see where they came from? No more healing happened. You're still at nine hit points. Um, he has a limited ability to use that healing kit. Each of you can only benefit from that once. If Flynn would like to heal you, that's perfectly fine. But mm-hmm. well, that's a different thing. Yeah, I have uh, five hit points left in my pool. How much do you need? Three. Yeah, I think if you're going to heal him up to full, you could heal him up to full knowing three hit points. Otherwise... Technically, like hit points are definitely super meta. He's injured. Yeah, I mean, I it's magic, so just I assume I just lay my hands on him, and it'll only heal what he needs. That's where normally I would say again, I don't want you guys talking about the numbers in general. Like, if you want to heal him where he looks healthy, it's going to be one point. If you want to heal him to max. It will take him, you'll give him the three hit points, but that also might completely consume your healing pool into the future. I just want you guys to get used to not talking about the actual numbers. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I didn't, yeah. So it's that two thoughts. Are you looking to heal him to where he looks healthy, or do you want to heal him to full? I'll heal him to full. So you can burn three more, and you can set uh, Sanguis back up to full. And then looking over the creatures, if you would like Sanguis, you can roll a perception to see what you can see with these corpses here now. Or you can roll... Gotcha. Let me continue into things, because I will often give you multiple choices. So you can do a perception here, kind of looking over these creatures. Um, there's not really going to be any evidence that tells you anything more about why or what they are. Um, you have a certain sense that they are acid-based creatures, but there's nothing about them that really is going to resemble anything other than a very simple, very basic sort of life. Uh, And these are not necessarily something that you're going to look for a will so much as essentially kind of like the lizard brain, the drive to survive. Um, And that's probably all you can really pick up from something like this being dead on the ground is it's really kind of like poking through. There's not like eyeballs. There's not really like organs. These are cellular creatures that just kind of expand, creating larger and larger versions. They don't really create anything beyond kind of like most basic organelles. Okie dokes. So I suppose we're done here. Um, I'm probably going to have to go soon. Uh, do you guys want to try and dig through that rubble and then come back to it next time? Or how, how do we go from here? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. If we, if we want to kind of call it here and, uh, you know, try and decide kind of how to proceed. Gotcha. Overall, you guys think you're going to stay inside of here at this point? Continue trying to look forward. 
I think now that we've kind of managed to cobble together some healing, yeah, uh, keep kind of Nobody started idiot. to wonder why Nundro sent you in here and said it's safe enough? Very good question. I, I do wonder why. <laughs> I'd mentioned that earlier. It's like, I thought he said it was safe in here. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Maybe we should go. That's what I brought it back it. up is because you said that, Bill. Yeah, maybe yeah, we should go talk to Nundo because maybe he's there's a little more to him than than we thought. So our end of the session is actually going to be you guys going back outside and seeing that there is no dwarf waiting out here. There's nobody. And Flynn, you're going to recall handing this person your invitation from Gundren, and they never gave it back to you. It's gone. Oh, no. Mm. Well, so, we much. will pick up next week. You guys are at the Dwarven Excavation. You have a solid sign that you met somebody who called themselves Nundro. They seemed to have some information that was enough to at least seem like Nundro. But after saying they would never abandon this place, they very quickly left this place.